Welcome to the Holistic Health Podcast, beautiful humans. If a professional, polished, well-edited podcast is what you're after, then move right on. If, however, you love unfiltered banter, unedited bloopers, authentic heart sharing, and a very generous dash of holistic health education, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in, shall we? Welcome back to the Holistic Health Podcast. Hello, Amy. What's Hello. happening? Good morning. I <laughs> got the giggles already <laughs> with regards <laughs> to our subject matter. I don't know about you. If you don't like potty humor, this uh, this episode may not be your favorite. Um, also, if you don't run in circles of health like we do, this also might feel like quite an alarming conversation to have. But I just want to assure you in the health professional world, talking about what comes out of your bottom and what it looks like, <laughs> smells like, how it's it like, feels like, what it behaves, how it behaves is very normal and a very key part about your health. So it's very true, isn't it? I I think I'm at the stage now that I forget how some, how uncomfortable it can make some people talking about it. And I realized this not too long ago when I was listening in on some student practitioners, you know, do practice consultations and they were, you know, they were asking the patient about their bowel motions and I could sense the awkwardness in their voice Mm -hmm. and no judgment or anything. I was just like, oh yeah, I forgot that that's a thing. (laughs) I just go straight in there. And I think the more comfortable you are with speaking about it, the more comfortable the person is to answer to an extent. Yeah, Um, yeah. Everyone has their own thing. (laughs) Yeah. Like I think the more you stumble over your words or try to create different words for the same thing, Mm. it makes it just more uncomfortable because it gives that energy of you should be uncomfortable about speaking on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if so you haven't cottoned on or maybe the title didn't give it away, we're talking about poo today, everyone. Yes, poo. I, I honestly think that pooing is one of like the simple pleasures in life. I actually <laughs> had chronic constipation when I was a maybe in my late teens. And the first time I did a proper poo again, one of the best days of my life. I remember exactly which toilet I did it in. I remember coming out and being like, mom, you will not believe what just happened. And we were so happy. It was just a miracle after being absolutely well and truly blocked up for a very long time. Oh my gosh, that does sound like heaven. And as someone who's never struggled with having a bowel motion, I can only imagine the joy you must have felt. Um, but I have I have heard from many middle-aged men that there's nothing more satisfying. <laughs> so for anyone else who's struggling, there there is hope. We're going to talk about a little bit about that today. Um, but it is, I think it's, a, you know, really, it is the standard for which we should all be aiming for. And I'm very glad, I'm very glad you're there now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I pride myself on some pretty good poos these days. Took a while to get there. Many are parasites found, gut imbalances, all of the things. However, it definitely made me learn a lot more about poo than maybe I would have otherwise. So I think it's just I'll take the silver linings and and you can all benefit from that. So where I thought we would start is talking a little bit about perhaps some of the checklists for what is a good poo. Mm. So I, and Amy, you may have different opinions or you may want to add a few things to what I'm about to share, but Mm. off the top of my head, some of the things that I would consider when I'm doing a bit of a poo checklist for my patients is that I really do think that you should at least be going once a day and maybe up to four times or so. It really does depend on, you know, your size as a human and how much food that you're eating. Um, So I think taking that into consideration is a good idea. I also think that they should be easy to pass and you should feel like you've had a complete evacuation. So there shouldn't be this 
kind of feeling that you've gone, but then you feel like you still need to go, but you can't get it out. And I'm sure most people can connect with a time that that's happened and no probs if occasionally that happens, Um, you know, just different things that are going on, sometimes stress, or if you've gone on a long flight or whatever it is may affect it slightly, but you don't want that to be a regular, you know, kind of experience for you. I would also say that They shouldn't smell like roses, but they also shouldn't have, you know, a real sulfur eggy smell because that can definitely be a little indication that something is off, uh, no pun intended. (laughs) Um, I think that's that's probably my top three kind of foundations. Is there anything else that you want to add to it before we go into some of the variations on that and what that might mean? Yeah, so just um, touching on the frequency for a second, that there is a bit of debate around like what is the healthiest frequency, and I think I think the, the bare the minimum standard is a daily bowel motion. I think there's no question about that. Um, I have had clients who have said, "Oh, I'm really regular, but regular was once a week or yeah. every second day." Um, that is not okay. It needs to be at least once a day. Um, other systems of medicine consider you should go after every meal, um, which means if you're eating, you know, three, four times a day, that might be three or four bowel motions a day. I think as long as you're within that range, that's okay. There's arguments for sort of excessive defecation, meaning that, you know, you might be extracting all your nutrients or the transit time might be a bit quick. So it it really depends. And of course, like anything, we always want to consider uh, let's let's if we want to call it a biomarker of health or a parameter of health in the context of all of the other things so you know if everything else is looking good and and you're going once a day i, I mean I, I personally think that's absolutely acceptable but if there are issues with gut health for instance um and you maybe have some bacterial overgrowth maybe in, an increased frequency might support you to eliminate excessive bacterial overgrowth um certainly a big issue um with bowel motions today and why people's guts are so unhealthy i mean there's a thousand factors but just speaking specifically to our fellow Aussies, only 1.5% of people consume the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables each day. So generally speaking, people are probably getting a third of the amount of fiber that they really need. Um, And we'll talk about what that looks like in the store. But the other thing I would add to your description of an ideal poo is that it should sink to the bottom of the toilet bowl rather than floating. Um, So it should go underwater and stay there. Um, The other thing is its colour. It should be a dark brown uniform colour, evenly distributed colour. And so any variations on obviously the odour, texture, colour and frequency outside of what we've just described would point to your gut needing a bit of TLC. Mm, yeah, I love love that. Very comprehensive. And I think also something to remember is we're looking at patterns, you know, we're, we all have a less than ideal shit every now and again, and no one <laughs> needs to panic because yeah, it really, it's more when I'm talking to clients about it. And when I'm, when we're talking to you guys listening in, it really is that you're looking for patterns that are happening through, you know, the weeks or the months that you've picked up on, as opposed to one-off events where maybe it doesn't necessarily go to plan. Mm-hmm. Um So let's go through some of, you touched on a few of the things that can indicate that something's off and I'd like to go into that a little bit more. So I'm just going to pick literally anyone that comes to mind. So I might start with, which is probably going right, right to the, to the bottom of the problems, but if they're black, so if you, if you have a bowel motion and it's not, not just deep brown, but it's like, really, it's like, is that? a black poo, Mm. if you're questioning that, um, then there may be bleeding that's happening higher up in your GI tract, or there might be a parasite, or there may be, you you know, you may be taking some medications um, that are causing that to be 
the case. So just double check medications, double check you're not taking charcoal or you haven't been eating charcoal bread. This happened to my mum once, sorry, mum, um, where she was had this charcoal bread that she had been eating and her stools were just like black and she panicked for a few days until she shared with me that that's what she was doing. And it's just something to be mindful of. And I think that any indication that there may be bleeding um, is a cause for investigation. Mm -hmm. If it's bright blood, it's usually something that's happening at the anal exit. So you might have a little cut or there may be some other things going on. I still think it warrants investigation just to be sure of what's happening there because there can be more things than just little cuts. Mm -hmm. But if it if the stool is black, it's more an indication that that bleeding is higher up or further up in your GI tract. So, you know, I think just being proactive about investigating that kind of stuff is is beneficial rather than freaking out and thinking, well, if I just ignore the problem, it might go away. Mm. Uh, often once you have an answer, you can do something about it. Mm. Yeah, that's such good advice. And I'm glad you went there first because that's really the most serious indication that something's going wrong on occasion sometimes it is something less sinister like a parasite or um you know an irritated polyp but if there is bleeding from the gut you want to get that investigated really quickly um, i'll just add to that in addition to the color often it's quite sticky as mm. well and that might also help you um, determine whether or not it's actually um, blood or you've eaten charcoal bread. So again, we're looking for patterns. If it was something that happened once, it may have been something you ate or something that was temporary. But I think anytime there is potential for blood in the stool, it should be investigated thoroughly just to make sure there's nothing else going on that needs immediate medical attention. Absolutely. All right. It's your turn to pick a problemo. Oh, okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to floating stools now, and nice what that might mean. Um, so, in the event you've got stools, poos that are floating on the top of the water instead of sinking, and sometimes they can be really hard to flush. They're those annoying ones that like you've just got to like hammer with toilet paper and then keep hitting the button because they just won't go down. <laughs> it's so bad if you're at someone else's house as well, oh. and you're like. So you're really like, uh, do they know how many times I flushed? Are they listening? Like, how, do you, am I going to run out of toilet flushing water? <laughs> okay, everyone. Everyone shits. It's okay. It's okay. There's, there's, there are a few stressful poo situations that you can get into. That is definitely one of them. Um, I've got another Something dude. you know a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. If anyone's listened, listened to episode, the third episode on how mold makes you sick, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Um, so... If it's floating, there's a few couple of main sort of categories um, of reasons why that would be uh, the case. And really the determining factor is the colour. So more commonly, we'll see stools floating that are lighter in colour. So as we mentioned, uh, we want to see a nice dark brown colour, which is indicative of bile and it's metabolised and it's done all of its things. So if it's lighter, so it might be a lighter brown, it might be orange, it might be yellow, or it might be like a white or clayish colour, that's a sign that um, there is fat malabsorption and it's actually the fat that's actually causing the, the stool to float above the water rather than sink. And that to me would indicate in general fat malabsorption, which of course can happen from pancreatic insufficiency too, but primarily we'd be looking for issues with the gallbladder, quality of bile, um, volume of bile. Is there an obstruction that's impacting bile flow coming down the common bile duct, which you know typically is gallstones, or is there an issue with the liver itself and its ability to produce bile, either the volume or the quality? And so over time, what we can see is obviously signs of essential fatty acid deficiency or and low fat being absorbed into the body, which, you know, the most obvious signs are things like dry eyes, dry skin, um, you know, keratosis pilaris. There's a few causes for that bumpy chicken skin you can get on the back of your arms, but um, vitamin A deficiency is part of that and low essential fatty acids. So if it's a light color, we know 
something's happened with the bile and you're not absorbing fat and it's causing the stool to float. Now, if the stool is floating, but it's the right color, that would suggest to me it is high in gas bubbles. There's a lot of fermentation activity happening in the gut. And whether that's bacterial overgrowth or uh, yeast overgrowth or a combination of both, um, I would then be looking at some sort of dysbiosis and, and loss of like the maintenance of the terrain in the gut that's allowed that to happen. So we definitely want those ones that sink like a stone. And that deep, satisfying plonk. Yes. <laughs> no backsplash though. Ideal. No, 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 not ideal. <laughs> Comes as a surprise sometimes. All right. So I'm I'm really showing my personality through this podcast. <laughs> Okay, so I love I love that explanation. And one thing I just wanted to add, in case anyone's not aware, but bile is it's like that dark green to yellowish brown fluid that is basically produced, you know, by the liver, and it's there to aid the digestion of fats. Um, so that's what we're referring to when we say bile. Um, and there can be lots of reasons why you're not producing enough bile, as Amy said, or you're not, it's not flowing out properly, properly or whatnot. So in case anyone didn't know what bile was, um, so what will I go to next? Okay. The next one I'm going to go to is the skinny sausages. So those real like wormy, squirmy type poos where it just, it looks like someone has like gotten Play-Doh and just rolled it up in their hands as skinny as they can. And then it's come out your back end. I feel like you're so much more eloquent at explaining <laughs> these things. But in case anyone wants the preschool version, that's what I'm talking about. Much and much this fun. can be a few things. So one, it can be as simple as a lack of fiber. So when you don't have enough fiber in there, the stool can lack bulk um, and literally that can affect the, the size of it. And that's what you're seeing reflected when you've got really skinny sausage poos. That's one thing. The other thing that it can, um, can indicate is that there's actual fecal impaction going on and it's creating, so fecal impaction is just basically shit that's stuck up in your bowel wall. And then the the new poo that's trying to get past is getting kind of squished down and is forced through this smaller pathway. And that's forming this skinny sausage kind of shape that's that you're seeing. So you can, I think something that's a bit of a, a myth or a misconception is that if you're going daily, that you can't have constipation or you can't have a form of constipation. But I do think that there is some cases where if you're having really skinny sausages um, coming out then, and you're already eating enough fiber, then it may be worthwhile investigating whether or not there is some fecal impaction going on. And one way to find out if that's the case, and I wouldn't necessarily go here straight away, but one way to visualize that is to get an abdominal x-ray and they can actually view whether or not there is stool stuck there. Um, but I would try treating the problem first with non-invasive type things before exposing yourself to any unnecessary x-rays. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that it can indicate is an overgrowth of bacteria. And that more so comes to the way in which comes back to the way in which an overgrowth of bacteria can affect motility and can also affect the way that your stool is formed and evacuated. Mm -hmm. So those would be my little, little hints. Uh, you're up, Amy. What's your next one? Okay. So oh my gosh, this is such a, can I call it a juicy subject? It's probably, it's probably not the right choice of words. But it's yeah, my, interesting choice of words. So there's so much you can learn from your store. And obviously that's why we're doing this episode because we're culturally, we're not culturally curious like some overseas countries are. You know, um, in certain countries they actually have toilets with a shelf so you can inspect your eliminations before you flush them. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm in the wrong country. <laughs> they, they make it easy for you to, you know, get up close and personal. But here's the thing, it can tell you so much about what's going on inside you. And, and I think it's just such, you know, 
we, we talked about how your period is your monthly report card. I feel like your poo is your should be your daily report card. Mm. How are you doing with your diet, your nervous system, all of that sort of thing? Because, of course, good digestion requires uh, a nervous system that can easily attain or remain in a parasympathetic state. So um, we'll talk about we'll talk about that in a second. But where I want to go next is mucus. So this is sort of um, a slightly lateral uh, direction on stool appearance. But if you're noticing mucus on the surface of your stool, um, if it's a fully formed stool, or if you're noticing mucus amongst the remnants of whatever's come out of your butt, Mm. you've got some inflammation happening in there. So a little bit like If you inhale something irritating like dust or mold or pollen, your nose is going to create mucus to try and wash that out of your nasal cavity and your sinuses. The same thing happens in your gut if there is something that's irritating or inflaming the inside mucus membranes of your intestinal tract. And this could be anything from, it can happen for lots of reasons too, actually. So if you have a poor, um, mucosal biofilm which is actually like a sticky mucus layer that houses your microbiome but also protects the lining of your gut from everything you're swallowing you can get irritation and then your um, mucus cells will then have to overproduce mucus to try and flush out whatever's irritating your tummy your intestines more specifically but if you've got parasites that can happen if you're eating foods that your immune system um, doesn't like is, is creating antibodies to you can have that it generally means in the broader sense of word of the word there's some kind of inflammation happening in there and it's your body's attempt to put out the fire and flush out the offending agent um, but certainly when we see chronic inflammation in the lining of the gut or the actual gut cells themselves and we you know there's conditions that that produce that all the time it can just mean just generally that your gut is very unhappy and needs a bit of help mm, love that Love a good mucus chat. Um, Okay, so next one I'm going to choose is if you've got really urgent bowel motions or like really explosive bowel motions. So it's kind of like those mini poop squirts that you can get. And Mm. this can definitely indicate a, a number of things again. And one could be that, as I mentioned before, that there's actually you know, stool impacted further up and it's kind of passing by like explosively by that stuck stool. That's one thing that could be, um, that could be indicating. Another is that there may be a lot of gas producing bacteria in your gut that are creating pockets of air, which need to be expelled and hence the many explosion sounds and where those pockets of gas may be, you know, I guess the Um, where they're coming from can be from bacterial overgrowth or excessive fermentation that's happening from certain types of bacteria that ferment those foods. So I see this a fair bit in uh, cases of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's not necessarily limited to that, but that's definitely something that that can happen. The other really simple thing that can happen to cause excessive gas is if someone's eating super quickly and like talking at the same time and you're swallowing excessive air while you're trying to eat, you're not digesting properly, things just aren't flowing the way that they should. So I would just check in on how you are eating first and then if that doesn't solve the problem, I would be looking into whether or not um, there is some kind of bacterial overgrowth Of Mm -hmm. course, getting really explosive or urgent bowel motions can also be an indication of a parasite. It can also be part of IBD, which is irritable bowel disease. And there are a couple of different um, conditions that come under those categories. The most common two would be Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I think there would be more indications that that might be going on for you than than just the bowel motions that are explosive, but it's certainly something to have on your radar. And if it's happening frequently, then again, just like when you see blood in your stool, it's something you want to get investigated so you can get to the bottom of what is actually causing it. Mm. 
Yes, love that. Also bacterial infections as well, so like acute gastro. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking more about general patterns here. Um, so that's probably, you know, if it's something that's kind of come and gone, you're probably okay. But you can get um, low-grade like sub- subclinical infections that will just set that response up too, which will then typically, you know, lead into a form of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so definitely stool analysis is quite helpful there to rule that out or you know determine what that actually is um all right so with there's quite a list here isn't there there is it's amazing that any of us can have a good poo with all the things that could go wrong honestly um it's like a christmas miracle by the sounds (laughs) of it um (laughs) all right so the next one i want to talk about is i want to go back to the bile story so we know like an insufficient production or if there's something blocking the flow of bile we'll see a stool that looks uh, too light but because it is this like greeny olive greeny color um, if your transit time is too quick you might end up with bile colored stools so like an olive greeny greeny stool um, more typically if there's something off you'll see people vomiting bile which is more of like yeah that greeny brownie fluid that's really bitter but with a transit time that's really speedy which is most often from infection although there can be other things you'll see um what's coming out from you know the bottom end of your body is a green color and so that would suggest to me the bile's come through from your you know right up the top of your small intestine out the other end far too fast and um you're basically the contents of your gut are not undergoing the metabolism that they ordinarily would. So again, I'd be looking at um, reasons that that's happening. Um, And most commonly that to me would indicate uh, an infection in the gut. Mm, Yeah. Good one. Gosh, there really is so many. Okay. What am I going to choose next? Um, Okay. uh, One that again relates to bile, um, is if you're noticing that your stools are really shiny or oily, this can actually be an indication that you're not digesting your fats properly and that, as we mentioned before, bile production uh, has a lot to do with fat digestion. So if you're noticing when you're looking at your stools and you look at them in in the toilet, and one thing I want to say here is if you're buying any kind of you know, toilet color water changer, please stop. Like you need to be able to actually see the poo as it's intended, as it's come out. I know that sometimes I go into different public restrooms and there's the the water color is like blue and I'm just not about it. It's just so much harder to assess your poo. Huh. So I just wanted to make sure no one's doing that. And if you are, please please uh, refrain yourself from doing it. So if you look into the toilet bowl, And sometimes you'll be able to see that the stool is really shiny or you'll actually be able to see fat droplets like you've gone in and you've poured olive oil or some kind of oil into the toilet bowl and you'll see them like almost floating on the top of the surface. So if you see that, um, definitely an indication that perhaps your, your, you know, your liver, your gallbladder needs some support uh, or you may need to slow down your eating um, or just investigate what is contributing to that. Again, maybe some pancreatic insufficiency. And um, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty simple one to identify and then look into what you can do about it. Mm, yes, love that. It's sort of like a, I guess, a less extreme version of those floating clay colored stools. Mm. It's still an issue all the same, especially because it's harder to spot and you're more likely to end up with, you know, nutrient insufficiencies and other issues as a result. Um, and of course, just just quickly, bile is also how we eliminate toxins from the liver. There's actually a lot of other functions that bile plays outside of the colour of your poo. And what that means is if there's any issues there, you, it's going to have a domino effect on the rest of your health, your ability to clear, you know, both internally generated um, metabolites that are waste products as well as 
exogenous or external toxins from the environment. So it's not, we're, we're no one, there's no like showground for your poo. Sadly, there's no gold medal where you can like show off your dark brown sausage mm. and, you know. <laughs> show like a- off your dark brown sausage. <laughs> I'm here for that when it comes to life. <laughs> I mean, get yourself a friend who you can send your poo photos to, I say. I mean, that's that's real love. Um, so what I'm saying is we're not asking you to generate a Victoria's Secret version of, the, of a poo to impress anyone else. But what it does do is it allows you to know that everything is functioning internally really well and you're not setting yourself up for any problems. Um, so so speaking of, of a non-Victoria's Secret model, stool um we've talked a lot about colors but you can also get other random colors like green or red based on things that you might be eating so um beetroot for example um might stain the stool red or if you're having chlorophyll it might be you know this a dark forest green and what I've noticed is there is this sort of um, conversation around that that has taken the view that that's normal and that is not my view at all. If your digestion is working properly and all of your enzymes and your bile and your brush border enzymes, your pancreatic enzymes, your stomach acid, you know, all of those aspects of digesting, breaking down and metabolizing food are working properly, you will not see a change in color in your stool um, regardless of what you're eating, unless, of course, it's charcoal because, you know, that is just black. You can't you can't change that. But I would suggest that if you notice if you've had a beetroot juice, your poo is redder. And I know some people have had quite a, a rude shock when they see the color thinking it's blood initially. That says to me there is some kind of digestive insufficiency happening. And as a result, those, you know, you should also know that those richly colored pigments that make fruits and vegetables so beautiful to look at, it means you're not digesting them and absorbing them. And therefore you're not getting the benefit of those on your health either. So yeah, just going back to that gold standard color um, is what you're aiming for. Mm, I love that. And I think that leads nicely into even just seeing food, undigested food in your stool. I think that's another thing to be aware of. And again, I think that that can come down to a number of different factors. I think that that can come down to just how you're eating or not eating or chewing your food. Um, You know, I think that a lot of people tend to eat while distracted, eat when they're rushed, eat when they're stressed, eat when they're emotional. And the reality is unless you chew your food well and you are in a rest and digest state, it's very hard for your body to produce, you know, the stomach acid, the digestive enzymes, the adequate amount of bile um, in order to break down your foods properly. So I think that that's, I really would start with eating, chewing and eating in a relaxed state and not over diluting your meals with a lot of water around the time that you're eating. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, in most cases that will sort things out. And if it doesn't, then I would get some further help into perhaps why, Um, again, it may come back to a lack of digestive enzymes, a lack of hydrochloric acid, a lack of um, function of the uh, migrating motor complex that might come from bacterial overgrowth. But generally I see when there's a lot of visible food in someone's stool, it's often coming down to someone who's not eating properly or is eating in a really distracted or heightened state where, you know, your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight nervous system is switched on as opposed to being in the optimal state for digestion to naturally happen. Mm. Yes, I think that's incredibly common. People watching TV while they eat or especially the news, which is like the worst combination you could have. Um, I know certainly at one point in my life when I was commuting for like an hour and a half each way and I had to be up really early to get to work on time, I'd eat breakfast in the car, which is just 
is so not good for your digestion. Um, but you know, it's all about balance, right? Mm. <laughs> priorities. My priorities was sleep, not eating at the breakfast table. But because most people are eating on the run, they're rushing to get food, rushing to put it down, eating at their desk. Um, and because we are most of us are operating under the influence of adrenaline most of the time we have to actually really consciously put ourselves back into a parasympathetic nervous system state generally anyway, just to live our best life, but also before meals and create that environment. And yeah, it's not normal to see corn bits or tomato skins or grated carrot in there um, at all. I know, again, it's one of those things that's been kind of normalized a bit and like, it's, you know, it's the butt of jokes see what I did there. Yeah. So, but it's actually, it's not, it's, it gets very much like so many of those symptoms as humans, we commonly get, and we think because everyone or a lot of people experience it, then it's okay. It's actually not. So we, we don't want to see any, we don't want to see it coming out the other end, the way that it looked or resembling remotely what went in the top end. Yeah. I've had a client send me a photo once of like a whole chili in First of all, I was like, how, why, how did you swallow a whole chili? <laughs> oh, my God. What? So she thought it might be a parasite or something like that. And when I looked at it, I was like, that's not a parasite. Like, that's a chili. <laughs> I have so many questions. <laughs> so I did as well. <laughs> I didn't get to the answer, but it was fascinating. Oh, my God. Okay, speaking of fascinating, this one is for the people who need a poo knife. Now, do you know? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say this? A poo knife. Are they scraping poo out their bum? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. Oh my god! I would hope you were going to use a friendlier implement if you were trying to like, <laughs> give yourself a manual like evacuation. evacuation? Jesus, nah. look, I'm. <laughs> I've heard a lot of crazy things. I don't know what people do. Oh, my God. Don't try this at home. (laughs) Um, Okay, no. And if you do, at least use a butter knife. Oh, my God. (laughs) Use a child's rubber silicon spatula or something. (laughs) Um, Okay, no. So a poo knife. Oh, my God. (laughs) I think this is the point of the episode where I'm finally losing it. Okay, I had the giggles before and I was trying not to laugh. I was trying not to look at you and I think I think I'm falling over the edge here. All right. A poo knife. Now, I did not know this was a thing until gosh, the like I don't know, 8, 9, 10 years ago, my boyfriend at the time, his best friend and in fact, his best friend's whole family They had a poo knife in the toilet cubicle because they did such large, enormous stools. Like he's broken toilets. He has broken people's toilets with his poo. (laughs) And and this is no word of a lie. He's done one that was like several feet long and like super, super thick. And like (laughs) these people have to chop it up with a knife so that it will flush and go down the toilet. (laughs) Oh, my God, I know. Are they even human? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So oversized stools, <laughs> um, that's an extreme example, but, like, it's it's a thing. There are some people that carry a poo knife on them. So usually um, this can mean a few different things. Um, I think most commonly it is a lack of uh, plant food actually enabling things to move through in a timely manner or and or excessive protein and so you're just getting this build up in the bowel that's and the bowel's very stretchy um, and so if it's not firm enough to actually trigger peristalsis which is what fiber is really good at you can end up getting this just like collection of stuff so then by the time you actually hit the go button this it's just this enormous build up of food. Now, if you have inadequate stomach acid, digestive enzymes, maybe even um, poor vagal tone or lax smooth muscle in the bowel that's allowing this to collect, that they can all be, you know, factors that feed into this. I don't know what was going on with this whole family and <laughs> 
and and the whole the whole thing but but it's I would consider that to be problematic myself and I I would be looking at what was setting you up to require a uh, a kitchen utensil <laughs> to get your evacuations into the sewer system God, that is wild. I've I am today years old that I've learned that. that that's the thing. That is amazing. I'll tell you another thing that I learned not that long ago is that a lot of surfers and stuff will poo in the ocean. And when they do poo in the ocean, it comes out as like just this one big, super long, floating, like log, just like train of a poo. Wow. I know it's really fascinating. Apparently it's incredibly satisfying. I've never been able to relax enough to poo in the ocean. I mean, like we all ocean pee, but yeah. I just I'm I'm it's just not the place for my poos. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. <Anyway. laughs> thought that was really interesting in case anyone sees a, a surfer away from their board. Oh my god, with okay. Their legs I- a little bit up, just <laughs> be clear. That's what's <laughs> just to get them a wide berth. I actually, I actually have pooed in the ocean once. And was it satisfying? Well, it was a bit stressful. So I'll tell you what happened. This is this is the podcast of TMI. I feel like we've <laughs> sunk to a level of TMI after my shark, extreme shark <laughs> story. And we can't recover. I'm really sorry to our listeners that this is this, this is the baseline of our show. Yeah. Um, anyway, I was in Western Australia. I had this beautiful beach with my now husband. He actually doesn't know. This is another. Do- he doesn't know. <laughs> I'm so sorry, James. I've made Amy. <laughs> <laughs> this is like confessions, and they're of the worst kind. It's okay. I don't think he listens to the podcast. So he probably will never find this out. But anyway, right. if anyone sends it to him, you're dead to me. I'm blocking you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we were swimming at this beach, and there was a um, a floating. Oh, a pontoon, a pontoon out there. And we're like, yeah, let's go and swim out to that and we'll lie on it and sun ourselves and splash around and come back. Anyway, halfway out there, <clears throat> we're swimming out there. <laughs> oh, God. I needed to go, um, I guess, because exercise does, you know, exercise really helps it. And I was like, and it was one of those ones where you're like, it is not staying in. It was like oh, no. knocking on the door and I'm like, this is cut. This is happening now. Wait, how far into your relationship is this? Oh, Margaret River, how, oh, two or three years. It wasn't. Okay. So- All yeah. right. You, you, you passed the initial I haven't even pooed at the house phase. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, I'm, I'm out there, and I'm like, I don't want him to know that I'm <laughs> need to do a poo. So I had to keep swimming, <laughs> trying to catch it <laughs> with my hand, <laughs> and then I had to wait. <laughs> wait till his head was underwater and I threw it I threw it I tried to throw it like far away (laughs) I'm so proud of you for telling this story this is great what do you mean was he swimming ahead of you or behind you I can't remember I feel like he was beside me maybe I slowed down so he would get ahead of me I must have I feel like I've blanked the trauma out of my mind oh dear Um, god Anyway, so I'm, like, trying to, like, get it out quickly, hold on to it, and then throw it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So I threw it. And I don't know. I mustn't have been really thinking about what I was doing. I was panicking. I was panicking. (laughs) And then then we kept swimming. I don't know. The tide was going the wrong fucking way. (laughs) So many like, what's that? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Rose, I keep just swim away from it. <laughs> anyway, that's my poo story. Poo in the oh ocean. God. So I didn't get to experience the surfer high of letting my like, <laughs> long log go and just, you know, being I proud of it. I was trying to trying to get rid of it. <laughs> oh my God. This is one of the best. This is better than your shark story. Like, just, how do you have this 
just many hidden gems. This oh, my God. We haven't even gotten started. Just you wait. <laughs> oh, my God. This is amazing. I love that story so much, especially the act casual, like, well, I don't know what this floating poop <laughs> thing is. Guys, that's definitely not mine. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Poor Margaret River, was there anyone else around or just you and James? No, there might have been like one or two other people on the beach. We were quite far out. I mean, literally, who who else is going to have been? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. I'm going to give you a minute to just gather yourself there uh, because that is that is the best story I've heard in a really long time. I like cannot wait for everyone to listen to this. <laughs> hopefully someone feels really seen and heard, <laughs> validated if they've ever done that. That's absolutely amazing. Okay. <sighs> Deep breaths, everyone. Where am I going to go to? Where do you even go to after this? Okay. So I'm going to go to uh, mushy and flaky stools. Yeah. So I think one of the simplest explanations for this can be a lack of fiber again, because that lack of fiber means that there's less bulk to them. I have to say also here is I do see kind of inconsistencies in bowel motions or sometimes a bit of a fluctuation between like well-formed, but then more so broken pieces or mushy in a lot of my endometriosis clients. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's something to take into consideration and uh, particularly if you have endometriosis because there can be adhesions that grow in endometriosis and they can actually grow on the bowel wall or in that kind of um, area and influence sometimes the way in which stool is passed or how it looks. So I think, you know, that that's just something I like to mention because I know that it's not always as simple as there's just an overt lack of fiber or there's just a bacterial overgrowth. Sometimes there can be physical, um, I guess, influences on the way that a stool might look or come out. And I do think the conversation around endometriosis and the way in which it does very much impact a lot of women's bowel motions and and gut health generally in terms of how they feel is an important one just to flag. And we will do a whole podcast on endometriosis. It's something very close to my heart. Uh, But for now, I just wanted to flag that in case any of um, our endo uh, patients or clients or people are listening. Mm, yeah, that's a nice one to, to mention, <clears throat> especially because of the way that this is like this real soup of like inflammatory icosanoids that can impact the way the bowel works, as well as the endometrial um, or endometriosis tissue, which of course can grow on the bowel, through the bowel, in the bowel. Um, so yeah, certainly that's a big one to look out for. And I think there's um there's a real connection there too. Often that's how endometriosis can be picked up even beyond the pain mm. is just that strange um, strange bowel function. Um, one of the I think the last ones that I want to mention is the little rabbit pellets. So um, these are like small little, you know, they couldn't be as sm- they could be as small as rabbit pellets, but typically are maybe like sort of golf, roughly you know, golf ball size rather than a proper sausage or a wheat bix. And you know, <laughs> wheat bix. How many do you do? How many do you do? Ideally, one to two. <laughs> um, <laughs> hashtag. Um, so with that, there's a few reasons that that might happen. Um, certainly dehydration is a common one. A lot of people are chronically dehydrated. And as a result, you're sort of seeing the stool clump into these smaller pieces instead of remaining, um, in a more formed sausage shape. Um, also a lack of fiber will, will do this as well. A fiber swells with water and adds bulk to the stool. It's the primary thing. And that does that. And so if you're not eating enough fiber, you just sort of, you're just getting bits and pieces come through. Of course, it can be indicative of other things. I know dysbiosis and bacterial overgrowth can present any number of ways. And that's definitely another way that it can. Um, and stress as well. So when you've got tension in your body, and especially under the influence of adrenaline, we actually see 
up to 75% of the circulation that would normally nourish and support the digestive tract get diverted to the organs of survival prioritized to like the emergency, you know, first responders. And as a result, you know, enzyme production suffers, um, hydrochloric acid production goes down, which of course is the trigger. Not to mention, as we said earlier, you know, with um, eating when you're stressed, you're chewing quickly, you're not chewing properly, swallowing air, you know, swallowing larger mouthfuls, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's a non, quite a non-specific um, indication that there's an issue, but uh, definitely another red flag. Mm, yeah, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned stress because I think I sound like a broken record in clinic sometimes when I talk about the way in which stress can affect bowel motions, bloating, gas, et cetera. And I do think there's a bit of a spectrum that this exists, that people exist on with this. I'm personally someone who has a very, my digestive system and my digestion are very sensitive to my emotional state or how stressed I am. Mm. And I think that it's true for everyone to a certain degree. And I also think that there are certain people in which it's just more profound. And I think it's something not to just dismiss Mm -hmm. because a lot of the time, as an example, I will have clients come to me who have, you know, significant gut issues and they have had these for a very long time and they have tried all of the things Mm -hmm. and in terms of both conventionally and sometimes also from an alternative medicine or naturopathic medicine perspective, And the one thing that they haven't tried or they're aware of but haven't really prioritised is the nervous system, the vagus nerve and that side of things. And often the reason why they haven't paid attention to it is because it's kind of their their weak spot, so to speak. They just, they don't know where to start with it and they're so used to being in a very activated um, heightened nervous system response for whatever reason. Probably, I mean, we could go off into a big tangent, but I'll restrain myself. And I think it's just really important to remember this, to, to not just kind of put that to the corner and go, oh, yeah, but everyone's stressed or, well, that's just normal. Actually really take a good, hard think about you know, how much is my stress coming into play with this? A little indicator can be how is your digestion when you are on holidays or you've got a week off or you um, are just in a period of time where you're intentionally slowing down. I think that that can be something that gives a little hint because some people, most of their gut issues go away when, when that happens. But I think we always know. I really do. Mm. Yeah, I think it is such a shame where stress has been normalised and and people have just resigned themselves, maybe even committed to just living life stressed and that is not a way to live. Please come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, I think that's such an awesome question to ask. What is it like on holidays? Um, I'm going to add that to my little questionnaire. Thanks, Nat. Um, (laughs) So I guess one of the other ones I'll just mention is sticky stools. And I guess this kind of goes back to that um, whole texture thing being a sign of maldigestion, but also certain foods. I had a client describe gluten as poo glue once. And whilst mm. um, gluten doesn't constipate everybody, it is a there are proteins within um, gluten-containing grains that we don't have digestive enzymes for. Uh, And so that can certainly create all kinds of issues, both local in the gut and systemically speaking. But certainly um, there are foods like that, things like peanut butter that are more typical um, of, of creating a sticky textured stool. And I think also a lack of fiber. Again, like if you want a Teflon poo, you need to be well hydrated and be consuming enough fiber. And so the minute you sort of have less fiber or less fluid we start to see this like sticky element come into play and of course that means you've got more cleaning work in the toilet bowl afterwards we want to see that victoria's secret model teflon poo come through that doesn't just leave leave a mark i mean 
I don't know. Have you ever done a ghost poo, Nat? Yes. Oh, so exciting. I have. Is that not the weirdest thing ever? Like I didn't even know if that was an urban myth, but I've done one once and it was just like, it was like being in the X-Files. I'm like, yeah. oh, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, it's when you do a poo and it's so solid and smooth and Teflony and heavy and healthy that it just shoots itself down the S bend. So you like get up, look down, and there's like literally nothing there. No sign of the poo, not even evidence that it was even there. It's just <laughs> gone. I mean, honestly, I felt like a unicorn that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not saying you should aim quite that high on a daily basis, although if that is your standard, wow, that is amazing. Yeah, I, I, it's very exciting when it does happen. I, I can't say it's a, it's a regular occurrence, but it has happened a, a small handful of times. And I have to say, I feel quite superior <laughs> when I walk out of the bathroom. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really it's something smug. you usually smug. go and tell someone. Well, I, I did actually, and I usually do, but <laughs> most people would not. So it feels like a quiet achievement. Mm. Anyway, that's okay. Mm. Um, I feel like we've covered such a, like a really good chunk of chunk lol, <laughs> um, chunk of different ways in which you know your stool may present and what indications that could give you. I'm sure there's some that we've left off, but hopefully we've covered the bulk of them. Mm. What I wanted to do now in the time remaining for this episode is speak to a little bit more about how you poo because I really think that this is a conversation that should be had. And I'm constantly teaching clients and people who go through my gut rescue program how to poo because Mm. most people are not pooing correctly, Mm. sometimes through no no fault of our own. So, Amy, do you want to talk us through the how to poo kind of uh, steps? Mm. Okay. Well, I mean, gosh, (laughs) it sounds hilarious to be instructing people on this given we all do it hopefully on a daily basis. But... What I want to say is before the invention of toilets, we would have squatted in order to eliminate and nature designed us that way or rather nature designed us so that when we were in any other position, our fecal matter was retained inside. No one wants to be busy, you know, living their life and and pooing themselves. Trust me, it's happened to me once and it wasn't great. Um, So essentially the way we're sort of set up anatomically speaking is the puborectalis muscle actually kinks the colon um, at the entrance to the rectum. So the rectum is typically empty and vacant of bowel motions and they sit further up um, in the colon waiting for you to go to the toilet. And what happens with that kink being there, it's really getting in the way of the movement of bowel motions coming through. Now, it's it's not like a complete shutoff valve. Like I personally don't have any issues going to the toilet in a, in a sitting on a toilet seat position at all. And maybe there's, there's a few reasons for that. But typically speaking, anatomically, we're not setting ourselves up for the best kind of evacuation. And when we look at the way our body is, uh, is working in our favour when we're squatting. There's a couple of things that are, that are you know, at play there. First of all, gravity obviously really helps because you've just opened up that pathway. Um, you've relaxed the puborectalis muscle, which actually allows the angle of the anus and the rectum to open up. So it's like opening the hydra slide so that the bowel can empty completely and easily, just getting rid of that, that kink um, and taking the pressure off um, the force that actually needs to be used to, to move the stool through. In fact, force shouldn't be used. If you're having to sort of hold your breath and push, that's called a Valsalva manoeuvre definitely some improvements can be made as far as your gut health goes. It should easily just slip out. But in the squatting position too, you've got your thighs sort of naturally pressing against the torso, which adds to the pressure internally that allows everything just to move easily. It also, interestingly, and this is probably the most fascinating piece for me as a clinician, is the valve between the small intestine and the uh, large intestine, the ileocecal valve, so where the ileum meets the cecum, is the inlet valve into the colon. 
And then, of course, the outlet valve is the puborectalis muscle that we were just talking about. I was just talking about. Squatting actually closes the ileocecal valve as well as opening the valve at the other end. And what it does is it means the pressure you apply if you need to to get a bowel motion out doesn't allow fecal matter to move back into the small intestine. Now, I don't, I don't hold the view that this is a common cause of SIBO or bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, but I think it's a factor that is overlooked or maybe not even something that people are aware of. And so you're essentially, it's better to keep your small intestine clean and stop sort of things that are, are leaving the body from coming back up uh, the gastrointestinal tract. So now we don't have toilets that are designed to stand on and squat. You'll break them. Um, and none of us, I don't think, really wants to create some kind of squatting outhouse. Now, some people have been known to change out their toilet to one that requires you to squat. I know when I was in China, that was just the standard, which, you know, if you've grown up in the Western world, is really confronting and feels it can feel a bit gross, but to be honest, from a health perspective, it's definitely the way to go. Although you do need to practice on how to keep your shoes clean when you do it. Um, there, But there are other ways that we can achieve that position in a way that's a lot more convenient and doesn't require us to do a, a toilet reno. Um, before we talk about that, do you think I covered that sort of anatomy of a healthy pooing position completely? Yeah, I think yeah. that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what can we do about it, Nat, if we don't want to go out and squat in the bush or our backyard? Well, you could join Amy for a swim in towards a pontoon in <laughs> WA. <laughs> that feels a little bit far away. Just kidding. That does, It's not actually the ideal position. <laughs> um, well, what I recommend that everyone has is a footstool or something that can elevate your knees higher than your hips. So you can get anything from you know, something really basic that's lying around your bathroom or home to do the trick, you know, uh, anything really, or you can get a little bit fancy and buy one that looks pretty and you love having in your bathroom. So um, the one I commonly recommend is the brand Proper, P-R-O-P-P-R. I think it's spelled, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, And that my, one of my uh, good friends and colleagues is the co-founder of that. And it is very, I don't have one myself at the moment, but I have gifted some to people. I've definitely used one at some friends' houses and it's beautiful. Mm. There's also the squatty potty. Um, that's another one. But honestly, you know, I just have a little kind of plastic step little stool that I I had a laying around from another purpose for a long time. And that's all I use. So you really can use, be creative what, with what you use. But I would say if you're someone who likes pretty things, then mm. the proper or the, or the squatty potty, I think the proper is, is pretty up it. Oh my gosh. It's so beautiful. So I, yeah. uh, I don't, I don't need it to go. Um, but my, my husband who does body work is like all about form and function. And so we, he bought at some point the plastic squatty potty, which is just, you know, like a white plastic one. And the way it's designed, it's sort of, you can push it in to hug around the toilet bowl and then push it out to use it. Um, but I'm someone who just, I just need things to be aesthetically pleasing (laughs) and the proper is like, wow, just the vogue of, toilet squatting stools there's like a beautiful timber one and there's also like a clear acrylic one if you like that minimalist look so that is definitely my cup of tea I feel like I want to buy buy like one of each just to have as a sculpture in my toilet yeah yes it's um so fun I I just love how you could you could sell anything you just (laughs) made getting a like a squatty potty or proper sounds so sexy and bougie that I feel like anyone listening who was a little bit (laughs) not on board is like, oh, of course I want a proper. (laughs) Sounds amazing. Love it. Um, And, yeah, we'll put the links to that in the show notes for you. Amy, is there anything? Oh, there was something else I wanted to add. I just remembered. So one thing I think, again, is an important factor to consider in all of the things that we've talked about already is that 
if you are having difficulties with your bowel motions and perhaps you've ticked off all the basics that we've gone through and you've done a few different investigations and whatnot, but you're still struggling, Mm -hmm. something that I think is overlooked and undervalued is actually the health of your pelvic floor. Mm. So someone like who you would go to see with for help with this is a pelvic floor physio and they'll be able to assess you as an individual as to whether or not there's anything going on with your pelvic floor that may be contributing to some of the issues you're having with passing a bowel motion or anything like that. So I think that's just something to be aware of, to have on your radar and um, have that as part of your investigative toolkit if you need it. I think that having your pelvic floor investigated at some point in your life is, is a good thing because I definitely see that it can contribute to bowel motions. It can also contribute to pain, like period pain or pelvic pain generally amongst many, many other things. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that in case anyone was not aware that that was a thing. Beautiful. I think that is something that most people wouldn't even think of when it comes to bowel function. So, yeah, if you have exhausted everything else, there's no parasites, your digestion's dialed up, you're in parasympathetic mode, um, absolutely, I'd be looking at that. Amazing. Well, we might wrap it up there for this very extensive poo episode. I hope you have all had a good lull and have taken away a bit of information to arm you with healthy digestion and healthy poos. If you're comfortable, hopefully you are, please share this episode with a friend or a family member because I think the more people that know about poos and what is optimal and what is not, the better. Um, And we will see you all in the next episode. See you.